Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Basaglar. Basaglar is a long-acting basal insulin used to treat diabetes. It's basically the same thing as Lantus. Now, diabetes is an important condition. 28 million people in the United States with it, that's 12% of the population, with maybe 40 million more people at risk for developing the condition. If we look 30 years ago, well, the incidence was about 9% in the United States. What's the difference between then and now? Simple, it's body weight. Basaglar is an insulin glar gene. It was initially tentatively approved by the Food and Drug Administration in August of 2014, but the competitor Lantus sued them. The FDA said, hey, work it out before we give you the final approval. They did. The final approval came in December of 2015. It was marketed as of December of 2016, so relatively new on the market. It was approved through an abbreviated approval pathway because it basically is the same thing as Lantus. The patent for Lantus expired in 2015. The company that made that drug brought out to Jo. To Jo is the same thing as Lantus, just more concentrated. Since Lantus was approved, the company that makes Basaglar was able to use some of the data that they presented to the FDA to show that the drug was basically the same thing. Now, it's considered a biosimilar in Europe. It's considered a new drug here in the United States. But basically, it's the same thing as Lantus. It's the same kind of protein sequence, and it acts the same way to reduce the blood sugar. It's manufactured in the laboratory. It's manufactured through DNA recombinant technology. It's a little modification of the insulin chain. It can be used for type 1 diabetes in adults and children or for type 2 diabetes in adults. Typically, it's used in addition to some other kind of medicine, either a different injection or an oral agent or even more insulin, the rapid-acting insulin. It's not for use in an insulin pump. You shouldn't mix it. You should use it at about the same time of day. You should always look to make sure that you're using the kind of insulin you think you're using. Oftentimes people have two different kinds of insulin, the immediate acting or the short acting insulin, and you have some of this long acting insulin. You don't want to confuse the doses because you get an increased incidence of hypoglycemia if you do. Again, the same time every day. It should be clear and colorless. You prime the pen to make sure it doesn't have any air bubbles, so you squirt out one or two units. Use a new needle each time you inject yourself. You don't share the pens even if you change the needle. You select the appropriate dose. You dial it into the pen. Pen can give you up to 80 units with one injection, and you change the site of injection. Use your abdomen, use the thigh, use your upper arm. You don't keep it in the freezer. You don't use it if it was ever frozen. You keep it unopened in the refrigerator between 36 and 46 degrees. Once you open a pen, you keep it at the room temperature, less than 84 degrees. You keep it there for about a month. And then if it's older than that, you throw it away. As with all insulin products, there's no set dose. The dose is individualized for you, depending on your metabolic needs, your blood sugar, your glycemic control. And when you start taking it, especially when you start or when you change dose or if you change your meal pattern, then you monitor extra carefully. If you're less than age 6, don't use the medicine between 6 and 15. You use the medicine on the basis of your body weight, but that increases the risk of hypoglycemic attacks. And it's used for people over 65, but unfortunately, as you get older, your vision isn't as good, your coordination isn't as good, you're more susceptible to hypoglycemia, and you have certain liver and kidney disease that makes it a little bit more risky, so a little more careful. The maximum effect of the Basaglar is about 12 hours. There's no peak effect. It lasts about 20 hours or so, so it might not last the entire day. And by 24 hours, you're back to your basal insulin level, pretty much. The way insulin works, it's all the same. It works by making certain tissues take up the blood sugar, so it goes more to the muscle cells, more to the fat cells, 
turns the liver's glucose producing machinery off, because under normal circumstances the liver makes sugar, it stops the breakdown of the fat and the protein actually causes protein to be synthesized, you oftentimes use the basal insulin once a day, but then you take some insulin, some short-acting insulin at mealtime. If you're really good, you can get your hemoglobin A1C, glycosylated hemoglobin, to less than 7%. That's very good, but that only happens about 50% of the time. In an open-label study, it seems to work equivalent to the Lantus, so no difference as far as outcomes are concerned. And just like Lantus, Basaglar did not seem to increase the risk of any cardiovascular disease, didn't increase the risk of non-fatal heart attacks, non-fatal stroke, cardiovascular related death, need for hospitalization for unstable angina or revascularization, didn't increase the incidence for cancer. Well, that's all good, but the most important thing to realize is didn't reduce the risk of those factors either, and those are the principal risk factors. You don't die of the diabetes itself. You die of the cardiovascular-related complications of that disease. You're at higher risk. Well, one of the other things is if you take insulin, you're at risk for hypoglycemia, potentially life-threatening hypoglycemia. So you have to be extra careful. You monitor when you change a dose or you use some other diabetes medicines in addition or you change your physical activity level, you work out more or you change your meal pattern, maybe you cut down on the amount of carbohydrate that you're consuming or maybe you have some liver or kidney disease. Hypoglycemic attacks are less obvious if you have a neuropathy or if you've had diabetes for a long time or if you're taking a beta blocker or clonidine or reserpine. Symptoms of hypoglycemia are individualized. Everybody has their own sort of symptoms and they can change. But the common ones are dizziness or lightheadedness, sweating and confusion, headache and blurred vision, slurred speech. Some people develop palpitations or anxiety or irritability because you make more epinephrine to try to push the sugar up. You can have some mood changes. If you're taking other drugs, they might increase the risk of hypoglycemia. So if you're taking a drug like lisinopril, it's an ACE inhibitor, or Diavan, that's an angiotensin receptor blocker. Those families of drugs increase your risk, and so too do the fibrates that drop your triglycerides. Even taking a drug like Prozac or an MAO inhibitor, even taking a sulfa drug because you have an infection, can increase your risk of hypoglycemia. Sometimes it's very mild and you take care of yourself just by having a little bit of sugar, having a piece of candy or some soda pop. But sometimes you need somebody else to help you. It can be that severe, can be potentially life-threatening, cause seizures, coma, or even death. That requires the help of somebody else. Other kind of complications you get potentially with insulin, with Basaglar, well, it can cause some sodium retention. Sodium retention means you have more water, you get some ankle swelling. If you have congestive heart failure, that can make it worse. And all that's especially bad if you happen to be taking Actos, which is another kind of oral agent that oftentimes can be used with the insulins, but probably shouldn't be. If you take insulin, it's going to cause you to gain weight most likely, because now you're not putting out the sugar in your urine, you're not breaking down some of the tissues, you're actually building tissues, so you could gain one, two, three, four, even up to seven or eight pounds. You can have some injection site reactions, so that's why you change the site of the injection each time you go from your thigh to your abdomen to your upper arm. Insulin pushes potassium from the bloodstream into the cells. That means there might not be enough potassium circulating around. That could be bad for your heart and cause arrhythmias or cause problems with your breathing. And if it gets low enough, cause death. And it's especially bad if you're taking a drug like a diuretic that puts the potassium out in the urine to boot. Well, there are some drugs that reduce the effect of insulin, Basaglar in particular. 
Those drugs would be the hormones, so birth control pill or estrogen or progesterone or prednisone if you're taking it because you have an allergy, maybe because you have rheumatoid arthritis, you have asthma, a diuretic or albuterol for asthma or a thyroid medicine or niacin if you're taking it to reduce your cholesterol or an antipsychotic drug, maybe Abilify for attention deficit disorder, maybe you have schizophrenia, maybe you have depression. Danazol, that can cause the sugar to go up. Some kind of compounds have varied effect. For instance, alcohol, you don't know whether it's going to push the sugar up or push the sugar down. Some drugs can block the symptoms of hypoglycemia, so you have to be careful when you're taking a beta blocker, clonidine, reserpine, as we mentioned. The economics are very interesting of insulin. Insulin was discovered in 1921 at the University of Toronto by Dr. Frederick Banting and his medical student, Charles Best. They developed insulin. They found it from the pancreas of dogs. They sold the patent to the University of Toronto for one dollar, one single dollar. However, last year, insulin brought in $24 billion, principally to three companies, Lilly, Santa Fe, Aventus, and Novo Nordisk, the insulin products are extraordinarily expensive. One of the benefit managers, Express Scripts, looked last year to see where they were spending their money. Most of the drug costs, the number one, was in the family of the anti-inflammatory drugs, the drugs to treat rheumatoid arthritis, Humira, and those kind of drugs. Second category, very close behind the anti-inflammatories, were the anti-diabetic drugs. And the anti-diabetic drugs count a significant chunk of change. And the insulins account for about 40% of all of the anti-diabetic expenditures. Now, depending on what particular insurance plan you have, that's going to determine what kind of insulin you get, no matter what the doctor writes on the prescription pad. So, for instance, if you have CVS Health, they only carry the Basiglar. They're not carrying the Lantus and the Tujeo. On the other hand, Express Scripts, they have the Lantus. That's on the preferred formulary. United Health, well, they moved Basiglar up to a Tier 1 and moved Levomir down to a Tier 3. Interestingly, there's a big lawsuit in federal court in New Jersey that was filed just in February of 2017. It's a class action suit against the three companies that I just mentioned on behalf of the people who paid full price for the insulin products. People paid full price because they didn't have insurance or they had high deductibles or they were in the Medicare donut hole. And their claim is that the companies increased the benchmark price of the insulin to those people while they decreased the price to the pharmacy benefit managers so they would put them on the formularies that we just talked about. Because if they're not on the formularies, you're not getting the drug. Well, how much does Basiglar cost? If you want to go to the drugstore right now and buy it for cash, it's going to cost you about $380 out of your pocket. But if you have a coupon from GoodRx, it's going to cost you about $340 and compare that same quantity to what Lantus is going to cost. So Lantus is going to cost you a cash price of about $400 to $450. Coupon price is about $260, $270 for the pens. To Jeho, well, it's about the same price, but you get less quantity. What's the price done? Well, let's pick on Lantus for a moment because that's been around for a while. So in 2001, it came out at $40. 2007, it was up to $70. 2011, it hit $100. 2013, it hit $140. 2014, it was $190. And 2015, it was $250. That's the same product. It went from 40 bucks to 250 bucks. And they're complaining. And the reason they complain is because now all of the companies have to have these copay savings cards. So you only have to pay 10 or 15 or $25 per prescription. 
and the insurance company says, well, we'll just sock it to the pharmacies or the pharmacy benefit managers or the insurance companies. But now they're getting smart and the insurance companies and the benefit managers are severely restricting the price rises and even actually decreasing the cost of the drugs for those people who have insurance. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is don't get diabetes in the first place. Watch your diet. Get your sufficient amount of exercise. If you do that, then hopefully you can control your weight. If you do that, then you won't have diabetes. You won't need insulin in the first place. And remember, if you do develop diabetes, chances are you're going to be using more than one drug. And we've just said that this one drug alone is going to cost you a significant chunk of change. And if you don't pay it out of your pocket, you're going to pay it with your insurance premiums for the following year. So what are the alternatives? Insulin is one of those kind of drugs that is extraordinarily frequently used and over a period of time if you're diabetic long enough chances are you're going to graduate to needing insulin. So the bottom line is again diet and exercise at least as far as type 2 diabetes and that's 90 to 95 percent of all of the diabetics. This is a preventable disease in the overwhelming majority of cases and it's a failure of appropriate diet, a failure of appropriate exercise, appropriate, that's going to put you at risk. And it's not only at risk for the finances, this is one of those diseases that increases your risk of a significant number of serious medical complications that you don't want. Diet and exercise, folks. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.